Hello and welcome to this MPTEL course titled uh, Trauma and Literature. We will be looking at a new text today. We'll begin with a new text today, which happens to be uh, Kurt Vonnegut's novel uh, Slaughterhouse Five. Uh, and this is the uh, second last work of fiction we will be looking at. Uh, you know, we'll have uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved after this, and we'll have a couple of um, philosophical works uh, on trauma and literature. But um, you know, in this novel, we will look at how it's very attitudinally similar to the novel that we read earlier, uh, which is Catch-22 by, by Joseph Heller, uh, which was uh, the setting of the, war, uh, setting of the novel was uh, Second World War. Now, this novel, Slaughterhouse Five, is, um, you know, it's, it seems to be set uh, around the Second World War, but actually it's a critique of the Vietnam War, and it emerged around the same time uh, as the Vietnam War did. And we find, uh, if we juxtapose those two novels, Hellas, Cash 22, and Vonnegut's uh, Slaughterhouse Five, we find they're very similar in terms of uh, the way uh, trauma is represented, in terms of the way the uh, traumatized subject is represented through, through comedy, through dark humor, uh, through uh, the laughter of exhaustion, uh, and also in a very postmodernist uh, play of space and time. Now, this particular book, uh, Slaughterhouse Five, uh, and we, we can see there's a title, the subtitle as well, but we, we find how this book has a really carnivalesque quality about space and time in terms of how uh, the sequences of the, e, uh, of the novel uh, in terms of plot, in terms of actions, are very non-chronological in quality and it almost has a magic realist quality. There's a, you know, uh, magical space, uh, a magical uh, planet. Uh, called from where peace comes from, uh, and then of course the site of the Second World War, uh, the historical site of the Dresden bombing, when the Allied forces uh, bombed Dresden. I and mean, that that becomes almost a centerpiece in the novel. That becomes very important, um, an event in the novel. And you know, as I mentioned, uh, Vonnegut himself was a war veteran, so a large part of the um, you know representations in this novel, uh, you know, are drawn on uh, from those experiences. Uh, and that obviously makes it more of a scouting satire. And as I mentioned, uh, this particular novel uh, is actually a satire, a critique of the Vietnam War. Uh, although it pretends to be a, a Second World War novel, it pretends to be a novel set in, in some of the space, uh, you know, some of the planet. But uh, uh, it's actually about the Vietnam War, and you know, it's a historical critique, a social critique of that. Particular war. Now, interestingly, the Vietnam War, as some of you would know, uh, was a very complex war in American history. I mean, it has been critiqued as a war of you know, an act of invasion, which is immoral in quality, unethical in quality, uh, and you know, there was a lot of backlash uh, that America faced uh, at the level of foreign policy, at the level of uh, you know uh, international uh, criticism of the war. But also from a medical perspective, from a sort of medical political perspective, the Vietnam War is also important because it introduced the term PTSD or post traumatic stress disorder. Uh, prior to that, there was no such classified term. I mean, we just we, we read Mrs. Jalloway by Mrs. by Virginia Woolf, and we saw how in that novel, for instance, um, the the idea of the the classification which is used as shell shock. Uh, which is the way to define the symptoms of a traumatized soldier. And you know, there's a question of masculinity, there's a question of uh, uh, the soldier not being manly enough, uh, and you know, the lack of heroism and all of that. But when it comes to Vietnam, well, we find that you know, it became such a big symptom that the, the military medical vocabulary had to come up with a term, and that was PTSD, a post traumatic stress disorder. So, what we look at. Uh, when we're reading Slaughterhouse Five, we look at the novel. We look at the opening in particular, a uh, very postmodern, playful opening, and then we'll have an essay. Uh, we'll look at a critical essay to examine the novel in some some more details. So, uh, as you can see, uh, this should be on the screen. Uh, the subtitle of the novel is interesting: Slaughterhouse Five or the C Children's Crusade: A Duty Dance with Death. So there is a dance macabre quality about this novel. And uh, there's a sort of children's crusade-like quality about the novel as well, and the sort of quasi-biblical ring to it, the quasi-pilgrim uh, uh, ring to it, uh, is interesting because the protagonist is also called Pilgrim, Billy Pilgrim, and uh, you know it's sort of focalized through his eyes. Although Kurt Vonnegut, as an author, is also uh, present in a very postmodern way inside the narrative, and he often draws attention to himself as a writer of this. Uh, so, you know, you find there is this quality of crusade, there's this quality of 
nightly, uh, um, you know, adventure, uh, but also the uh, proximity with death, the duty dance with death. And that, that's part of the irony in the novel that, you know, the whole idea of military adventure, the whole idea of military masculinity is actually a duty dance with death. You're always dancing with death as an act of duty, right? And we will talk about the quality of duty, heroism, honor, masculinity in a moment when we sort of go further in. But suffice it to say, this novel is also, uh, I mean, along with being such a compelling depiction of trauma and war, uh, it is also a very scathing satire on military masculinity. It, it completely deconstructs and debunks the myth of military masculinity in terms of how uh, the, the sort of heroism, the nobility, uh, the glamour of military masculinity is completely, uh, you know, taken off, is completely, uh, uh, you know, undercut by the representations in the novel. And in that, again, is very similar to what we saw in Heller's novel, Catch-22, where, uh, you know, instead of uh, this military heroism, what we have is sort of cynicism of the highest order, very dark, humorous cynicism. And that dark humor in Heller's novel, uh, the irreverent uh, cynicism in Heller's novel, uh, actually accentuates the trauma. And we, we discussed that when we read the novel, that instead of uh, making it profound and tragic, what Heller does, it makes it pathetic and you know, emptied of meanings. And this emptiness and exhaustion of meanings is what makes the trauma uh, more insufferable, more uh, moving, uh, more disturbing for us uh, readers. So we find something similar happening in Slaughterhouse Five as well. And as I mentioned, this is uh, more of a deliberately postmodern take on uh, one. And uh, you know, there's no temporality, there's no temporal sequence, there's no chronology per se, but it's all jumbled up and it, it inhabits different space and time. There's imaginative space and there's this um, you know, planet called uh, you know, uh, Trafimadori, which is a fictional magic realist planet. And we, we can see that you know, in the uh, title itself, there's this uh, a little short description, almost like a blurb of the novel where it says, a fourth generation German-American now living in easy circumstances on Cape Cod and smoking too much, who as an American infantry scout uh, all to combat uh, as a prisoner of war, witnessed the fire bombing of Dresden, Germany, the Florence of the Elbe, a long time ago, and survived to tell the tale. This is a novel, somewhat in the tele telegraphic schizophrenic manner of tales of the planet um, uh, Trafimadori, where the flying saucers come from peace. Uh, interestingly, this is uh, largely autobiographical in quality, as I mentioned. I mean, uh, Vonnegut himself who was a veteran of the Second World War, he himself experienced a Dresden bombing, but he survived it because he was a prisoner. Uh, interestingly, he was a German prisoner, I mean, he was taken by the Germans, and he was inside a cellar, as a result of which he survived the Dresden bombings, which the Allies did during the Second World War. So, you know, this whole story can be seen as an act of reconstruction from that traumatic moment of being bombed uh, by your own forces. And that, that sort of complicates the whole uh, friend-enemy binary in the war, because on the one hand, uh, he was about to be killed by his own forces because he was a prisoner of in war, and he was sort of captured by the Germans. But because he was captured by the Germans, because he was put inside a cell up, he survived the bombings of his own army. So that really problematizes and blurs the borderlines between friend and enemy, insider and outsider, which is the whole point of this novel, because in a certain sense, uh, that is a postmodern pluralism, that is a postmodern polyphony, that you don't quite know the difference between the inside and the outside, between the friend and the foe, uh, between the attacker and the you know, sufferer. And you know, everyone dies in the war, and the war kills everyone. And there's no, there's no winner in the war per se. And that is the whole philosophy of this novel, that it, the war doesn't leave any winners. So they're just survivors and, and dead people and everyone loses in the war. But obviously what makes this novel more gloomy and more dark uh, in a postmodern sense is the sort of tragic comic quality, this uh, play of sequences, uh, the play with temporality uh, and this non-chronological uh, uh, narrative strategy to which everything is depicted through the eyes of uh, Billy Pilgrim and also uh, the writer uh, Kurt Vonnegut who is sort of who constantly implants himself in the novel per se. Okay, now if we just uh, take a look at the opening of the novel, uh, this is first published in 1969 uh, you know, around the time of the Vietnam War. But, but look at the way in which uh, the war, the Vietnam War, the real war is, uh, you know, distanced from, you know, and 
the whole idea of the historical war is moved away from and then it is spoken from the position of another war, the second world war. But you know, actually it is representing the Vietnam war, it is depicting the Vietnam war, the futility, uh, the immorality of Vietnam war uh, from the American perspective. And you know, several critics have said this is one of the biggest anti-war novels written around that time. And you know, as some of you would know, uh, there's a lot of anti-war protests which are happening uh, around the Vietnam War. I mean, inside America and, and also from the international community, that war was um, you know severely critiqued, massively critiqued in terms of an immoral, illegitimate war. Uh, and America obviously uh, got a lot of backlash in terms of military uh, backlash as well as uh, from international societies, where you know including the UN where you know this war was seen as an act of immoral invasion. So, there's a sort of illegality about the war, uh, there's guilt about the war which informs the trauma in a certain sense because Vietnam War as I mentioned is sort of the macro moment in um, military history, in American history where the medicalization of trauma, uh, military trauma, the medicalization of military masculinity uh, reaches a sort of climactic point with the classification of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And you know, and if, it is against this backdrop that we have this novel, this sort of tragic comic, a darkly funny novel, a carnivalesque novel about uh, heroism uh, and the futility of heroism, the futility of existence. And you know, this uh, flights of imagination or flights of uh, fantasy through which you know, uh, peace is seen as the uh, something belongs to another planet. Uh, it doesn't inhabit. It doesn't belong to the planet Earth anymore. Uh, you know that that's part of the cynicism. That's part of the gloom. That's part of the depression around that time, uh, which is also uh, you know, the time in which lots of protests, lots of rebellion against um, Western imperialism, uh, lots of rebellion against American imperialism were uh, were happening. So this work of fiction is, is very much situated in that rebellious uh, moment. Now. If we take a look at chapter 1, uh, which we will, uh, we find that how this sort of, uh, the opening is quite metafictional in quality, the opening is quite, uh, uh, you know, um, constructed in quality and it draws attention to the writer, draws attention to the act of writing, which is a classic postmodernist uh, strategy. And the very opening sentence is interesting and there is this ambivalence about it, which is all this happened more or less, right. So, uh, it starts with uh, the first half of the sentence, uh, it pronounces uh, something else, true, all this happened. And the second part of the sentence just approximates it, says more or less. So, it's an approximation, it's an articulation of approximation. It's not really, uh, you know, it's sort of trying to suggest all this has happened, but then it's also uh, warning us uh, and advising us to acknowledge that this is sort of more or less, it's an approximation. Now. What it does at a very fundamental level is that it talks about how truth is always an act of approximation, how reality is an act of approximation. The only access to reality, the only access to truth can only be through an act of approximation and nothing else. Right? So, you cannot um, you know, access truth as a universal construct. There is no universal truth, there is no reality apart from what is you know, insufficiently experienced, uh, what is apart from what is approximately articulated. So, that, that quality of approximation, ambivalence and insufficiency is very much there, planted in the very opening sentence of the novel. All of this happened more or less. Uh, the war parts anyway are pretty much true. One guy uh, knew really was shot in Dresden for taking a teapot that wasn't his. Another guy I knew really did threaten to leave his personal enemies killed by hired gunmen after the war, and so on. I've changed all the names. Now, this sort of starts off, uh, as you can see, uh, from the position of almost a pseudo memoir quality. It sort of tries to uh, present itself as some kind of a memoir, some kind of an account of what happened to that character who is now a writer. But interestingly, and let's look at similarities and convergences between this novel and Catch 22. If you take a look at the third sentence, that you know, someone was shot because he was taking a teapot that wasn't his, and it almost has a funny quality to it, and almost a tragic comic quality to it, except that it's not comic, it's actually quite tragic. And again, in this, this is quite similar to Catch 22, where a tragedy emerges, or uh, death emerges, or loss emerges, not necessarily out of profound activities, but you know, out of very flippant activities, very domestic mundane activities, uh, which goes on to uh, show how trauma is just becomes a norm. Trauma becomes about the daily discourse of living, 
uh, in these wartime conditions. It's not something which needs to have a profound shape, which needs to have a raisin day tray, which needs to have some rationale. It just can be a very irrational event, an act of accident, you know, the trauma, loss, tragedy can emerge out of little acts of accidents. So, someone took a teeth while it wasn't his and got shot. And uh, another guy I knew really did threaten uh, to have his personal enemies killed by hired gunmen after the war and so on. I'll change all the names. So, the violence of the war, how that got extended after the war when someone wanted to hire a personal gunman and kill all his enemies. And then we are told that the names have been changed. I really did go back to Dresden with um, uh, Guggenheim money, God love it, in 1967. It looked a lot like Dayton, Ohio, more open spaces that Dayton has. There must be tons of human bone meal in the ground, right? So, again, uh, look at the way in which uh, the sort of carnivalous quality of mixing up positives and negatives, mixing up nice, serene features and shocking, shuddering features, they, they converge together in the same way as they do in Heller's novel, Castro and the Two. So, we are told that when he went back to Dresden uh, much later, in 1967, uh, decades after the Second World War, it looked a lot like Ohio, uh, lots of open spaces, more open than Ohio, so it's nice and scenic and pleasant except for the fact that he knows that there must be tons of human bone meal in the ground. So, lots of corpses must be buried in the ground. So, the constant proximity to death and you know this is what I mentioned at the beginning, this sort of duty dance of death. Uh, you are duty bound to dance with death. That means you can, you, you're always already dead in a symbolic way. And that is a whole uh, part of military masculinity. There's a whole part of the heroism of military masculinity that you know it entails a duty dance with death. It entails uh, uh, compulsory, uh, you know, uh, dance with death. It compulsory movement with death. Compulsory function with death. Uh, and that that just becomes uh, part of the norm. Uh, even an open space like uh, you know Dresden, uh, you know, the proximity to death is um, is always there. And there's also a spectral quality. I mean, this is a ghost town really. I mean, it's sort of built out of human bones, it's built out of human corpses, it's built out of human dead bodies, it's built out of deadness. So, everything that has grown in Dresden over the years after the Second World War has grown out of deadness, has grown out of spectrality, has grown out of absence. So, this is this ghostly quality about Dresden which is being uh, hinted at. I went back there with an old war buddy, uh, Bernard Five O'Haran. And we met friends with a taxi driver who took us to the slaughterhouse where we had been locked up at night as prisoner of war. So, this is a symbolic slight, uh, site, the slaughterhouse where uh, Vonnegut himself was uh, you know, taken as prisoner uh, in Dresden. Uh, his name was uh, Gerard Muller, and we, we find that in the beginning of the novel, this is sort of dedicated, this book is dedicated to Muller, uh, obviously a German person. He told us that he was a prisoner of the Americans for a while. We asked him how it was to live under communism and he said it was terrible at first because everybody had to work so hard and because there wasn't much shelter or food or clothing, but things were much better now. He had a pleasant little apartment uh, and his daughter was getting an excellent education. His mother was um, um, incinerated in the Dresden firestorm, so it goes. Uh, I mean, we can see how uh, the constant commingling, the constant convergence between the pleasant positive orders and the negative shocking orders sort of go on. So, we are told that, um, you know, things have become a bit better in Dresden and, and the communism has become more bearable according to this person. So, uh, his mother was, uh, his daughter is getting good education, that's a good thing, but his mother was burned to death in a, in a fire, uh, in a Dresden firestorm. So, it goes. So, it's this constant ambivalence, this constant mixing of negativity and positivity, this constant mixing of destruction and, um, you know, aspiration. That's what happens after this, after the war. Right. Um, he sent O'Hara a postcard on Christmas time and here it, here is what it said. I wish you and your family also as your friend Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and I hope that we'll meet again in a world of peace and freedom in a, in a taxi camp if the accident will. I like that very much, if the accident will. Now, notice instead of uh, how instead of God will, uh, what it says a postcard is if accident will. Now, what that means, what that suggests, and this is why we are looking at the opening with some um, attention, it talks about the uh, 
the accidental condition of human existence. So, human existence is almost always already an accident. It emerges out of accidents. Birth is an accident, death is an accident, life is an accident. And what what time uh, reminds us is something that we always already know that we are just products of accidents. So instead of any divine design, any metaphysical you know, design with controlling our fate, uh, what is acknowledged over here that if it's the will of an accident, we will meet again, right? So this this bit of the randomness principle, the chaos theory. Uh, of human existence is something which is articulated and you know, it's so in your face and it is highlighted and foregrounded and that's what seems attractive and honest uh, to Vonnegut as a writer. Um, I would hate to tell you what this lousy little book cost me in money and anxiety and time. When I got home from the Second World War 23 years ago, I thought it would be easy for me to write about the destruction of Dresden since all I would have to do was to report what I had seen. And I thought too that it would be a masterpiece or at least make me a lot of money since the subject was so big. Now, this is a bit in the novel where um, he's addressing, Vonnegut is addressing the, the reader directly. So he's saying, you know, where I came back from the war, I thought it's just going to be a cakewalk, a very easy thing to write about Dresden because I was held as a prisoner. So I thought, just, you know, recount and reconstruct and remember what, whatever happened and just write about it and it will make me famous and bring me a lot of money. Uh, but instead, what we are told by him is that this book caused him a lot of anxiety and he describes this book as a lousy little book, uh, you know, and um, that's interesting because that, that irreverence, that cynical irreverence uh, to trauma is something which we see, um, you know, even happening in Heller's uh, Catch-22, where uh, it's, so, uh, it's so traumatized, it's so uh, full of trauma, it's so numbed with trauma, that even the profundity of trauma, the glamour of, you know, tragedy, uh, the, the darkness of trauma just disappears entirely. And what we have is just one cynical survivor's guilt, uh, one cynical survivor's self, uh, which just talks about how the little things, the little accidents made him survive. And, you know, and that, that sort of makes him hollow to the core. And that, that hollowness, uh, the existential hollowness is very much there as part of the uh, traumatic condition. And uh, what's interesting is that how that existential hollowness connects to the more macro hollowness of the war, where we're just fighting a futile war, where war is just seen as an act of invasion and greed, corruption, and just entirely about the futility of power, the futility to expand to one's power and become more powerful. But, uh, you know, the interesting thing over here is how this book per se, this novel per se, is seen as some kind of a failed enterprise, is seen as some kind of a personal project which did not really work. And, and that's that cynicism, that, that metafictional postmodern cynicism is very much there as a principal attitude in the novel. Okay. And he thought that it would be a masterpiece, uh, or at least make me a lot of money as the subject was so big. But not many words about Dresden came from my mind uh, then, not enough of them to make a book anyway. And not many words come now either, when I've become uh, an old fart with his memories and his Paul Mars, with his son's full grown. I think of how useless the Dresden part of my memory has been, and yet how tempting Dresden has been to write about. And I'm reminded of the famous Limerick. Uh, there was a young man from Istanbul who solidly quest thus to his tool. You took all my wealth and ruined my health, and now you want to be your old fool. And I'm reminded too of the song that goes, my name is Jan Jansson, I work in Wisconsin, I work in a lumber mill there. Uh, the people I meet when I walk down the street, they say, what's your name? Uh, and I say, my name is Jan Jansson, I work in Wisconsin, and so on to infinity. Now, there's a reason why we have these two nonsense poems, where we have these two uh, limericks over here. The first one is a very vulgar limerick about, uh, you know, the male genitalia and the old idea of decadence and senility. And the second one is the, again the vulgar limerick about uh, you know, forgetfulness and you know, repetitive rituals. Now, the reason why these two limericks are uh, juxtaposed together and they sort of come right after uh, the, you know, the terrible tragedy uh, that this person has suffered is because it talks about the futility of remembrance, it talks about the futility of narrative, it talks about the futility of storytelling, and it's also talking about the uh, the purpose to preserve an experience through stories and this temptation, uh, the seduction to move away to nonsense, uh, this temptation to sort of merge with nonsense. And you know? also, he's reminded 
of the famous limericks, which are um, the sing-song nonsense rhymes, uh, which you know seems to be seem to make more sense to him than his remembrance of things past. So. Uh, What's interesting, and we will stop at this point uh, in the session, what's interesting is how uh, the terrible tragedy of uh, Dresden, where he was himself a part of, where he experienced the bombing, he experienced the you know, sense of being trapped, he experienced a sense of this near-death experience, how that doesn't lend itself to a narrative, how it doesn't lend itself to, uh, you know, this uh, you know, shape of a narrative and how frustrating that is in trying to remember something which had happened to him, in trying to remember something which he experienced and yet not being able to say it. And that futility, that purposelessness, that inability to say what one means is exactly what makes this, uh, you know, novel an act of futility, an act of, uh, you know, purposelessness. And that is what tempts him and that is what reminds him of the sing-song nonsense rhymes about endlessness and decadence and senility and forgetfulness and purposelessness and exhaustion, right? So the two are limericks at the beginning of the novel, they are quite symbolic and they play important functions in the novel in terms of suggesting to us how uh, meaningful narratives can always be elusive in quality, especially when it comes to uh, a traumatic memory. How to produce meaningfulness, how to produce meanings out of narratives might just be a distant dream. And, you know, the more easy, uh, the more tempting, the more purposeful, the more uh, you know, pointed after representation may just be limericks, which doesn't make any sense, which don't make any sense, but, you know, they just are the sound bites, uh, which is all that there is to it uh, when you recount uh, a traumatic memory. In other words, the difficulty to convert a traumatic memory into narrative memory, the difficulty or the near impossibility to convert uh, a traumatic experience into a narrative shape is uh, suggested over here, is uh, foregrounded over here, especially highlighted by the appearance of these two limericks, these sing-song nonsense rhymes uh, about, uh, you know, masculine exhaustion and uh, endlessness and, you know, this ad infinitum quality about uh, names and identities and, you know, purposefulness. So, what we see at the beginning, the very opening chapter, and that's the reason why we spend some time with him, is the futility of war, uh, the exhaustion of war, and the, the, the numbed condition that trauma creates. And in that is very similar again to uh, Cash 22. I mean, in that novel too, we have uh, in the character Wurserain and the other colonels around Wurserain, where they're so numbed by trauma, by consuming trauma at a daily level, that they, so they play little rituals, they invent little rituals and limericks and different ludic narratives, playful narratives, ludic is playful. Uh, just to make, fill in the time, fill in the space, just to make some kind of a pseudo meaning of their existence because the war has reminded them, uh, the futility of war, the violence of war has reminded them uh, that there is no meaning to this existence, there's no meaning to this masculine military heroism and it's completely uh, a nonsense. So the arrival of nonsense at the very beginning of this novel is quite symbolic in quality because that becomes a pointer to the bigger, broader nonsense of the war, which doesn't make any sense. So limericks just become the most authentic forms of representation when it comes to war. So over the years, people I have met have often asked me what I am working on, and I've usually replied that the main thing was a book about Dresden. I said uh, that to Harrison Starr, the movie maker, one time, and he raised his eyebrows and inquired, is it an anti-war book? Yes, I said, I, I guess. You know what I say to people when I hear they're writing anti-war books? No, what do you say, Harrison Stump? I say, why don't you write an anti-glacier book instead? What he meant, of course, was that there would always be wars and there would be then that they weren't as easy to stop as glaciers. I believe that too. Uh, so this is again a very interesting um, metaphor, anti-glacier books. Uh, and anti-war books and anti-glacier book uh, are just the same thing because it talks about the inevitability of war. It talks about the uh, you know, the limitlessness of war and how wars will always be there since the beginning of evolution. So it's as purposeless uh, to write about uh, war or write about, you know, a critique of war than to stop a glacier from moving, right? So there will always be war. So it points to the inevitability of this political position uh, this war of war and the futility of the position of resistance, uh, the position of you know, rejection. So that, that becomes, again, part of the futility of the whole writerly project. And that's what this book is doing at the beginning. It's talking about, it's highlighting the failure or the collapse of the futility uh, 
of the writerly project, which informs a book like this, which informs this carnivalesque postmodern book, which is also an anti-war book about the Vietnam War, without naming the Vietnam War, which is drawing on the writer's own experience of um, the bombed Dresden and Second World War and talking about survivor's guilt and talking about the numbed condition caused by trauma. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, this open acknowledgement of the futility of war, the futility of representing the war and the futility of taking a position of resistance against war. So I stop at this point today and will continue with the session in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.